Welcome to the 2016 Gate River Run Medical Volunteer Training, and thank you for volunteering to help keep these runners safe. This effort is led by the Trauma One Flight Program out of UF Health Jacksonville. As a quick introduction, the Gate River Run is the largest 15K race in the U.S., attracting over 20,000 runners each year. In 2015, we treated over 120 patients just in four hours. Most of these patients were released from the medical tent, but this is essentially a pre-planned mass casualty incident. As you can see by the course map, the race takes its way through various parts of the city and includes two bridges, the last of which is right before the finish line. The race starts and begins at the Jaguar Stadium. Now on the day of the race, it's very important that all volunteers arrive on time. We are asking everyone to be at the medical tent before 6.30. This will allow us to have continental breakfast and hand out t-shirts. At 6.45, teams will depart for the stations along the race course. The roads will close at 7 o'clock and no one gets in or out after that point, so please be on time at the medical tent before 6.30. Medical volunteers have two options for parking. First of all, a shuttle will be available from UF Health with information on the next slide. In addition, you can park at the stadium in Lot R. Again, please park by 6.30. This year, there will be one shuttle running from UF Health and it will leave at 6 a.m. from the towers at 580 West 8th Street. This map shows the location of Lot R at the stadium. Once parked there, you are within walking distance to the medical tent, which will be located at Gate 2 of the stadium. Some individuals will have 800 MHz radios to communicate during the event. If you are asked to use one of these radios, please keep all communications short, sweet, and to the point. Our role as providers in the medical tent will be to treat patients who are brought to us from the finish line. If these patients need transport, it will be done by Century Ambulance. All other patients along the race route will be transported by Jacksonville Fire Rescue, although they may need to bring a patient to us depending on their resources and availability. An important thing to remember is that transportation is a vital resource that we must keep control of. We should only be transporting patients whose care needs go beyond the scope and resources that we have available at the race. This diagram shows the general setup for our medical tent. We'll have four main areas, acute care, orthopedics, respiratory, and resuscitation. Each volunteer will be assigned to a specific area for the race day. Now there are many pieces of the puzzle that keep the operations running smoothly on race day. The two gentlemen pictured here are Chad McIntyre, who will be the director of operations, and Dr. David Ebler, who will be the medical director. Now it is imperative that every patient that we treat in the medical tent has a medical encounter form. We need to get as much patient information as possible. This is for medical, legal, and research reasons. Things like race bib number, sex of the patient, reason for encounter, the care given and disposition, and recommended follow-up all need to be included on this medical encounter form. Now this is an example of the encounter form. As you can see, there are areas for all the pieces of information that we need. Now if you're treating a patient and you realize that a form is not being filled out, please alert a team member and get this in process. Now you can definitely expect more information to come before race day. We also have a day of race briefing and after race action reports. In the meantime, you can email riverrun at jacks.ufl.edu if you have any questions about the operations. And now to the reason why we're all here volunteering. What are the medical issues that we can expect to see during this race? Things that we definitely will see are heat-related illness, including cramps, exhaustion, and stroke, exercise-associated collapse, shortness of breath, GI issues, and musculoskeletal injuries. We will now go into a little bit more detail about each topic. Now the prevalence of heat-related illness will definitely depend on the weather of the race day, but you can expect to see some sort of disease along the spectrum just based on the duration of the race. Heat-related illness can start with heat cramps, which is just general cramping of any major muscle group, then go into heat exhaustion, where the person gets a high temperature and feels fatigued and weak, all the way to heat stroke. Now these illnesses are defined as a core temp above 40 C or 104 Fahrenheit. What differentiates heat exhaustion from heat stroke, which is the most severe form of the disease, is ultramental status. Once these patients display ultramental status, they are critically sick and have to be treated quickly. There are three main steps to the initial resuscitation. That's remove from the environment, check and maintain ABCs, and start cooling. This disease process is completely different from fevers that we think of with infection, so Tylenol is not indicated in these patients. Now the method for cooling will primarily be based on the patient condition. 
For non-critical patients, we can start with passive cooling. Essentially, that's resting the patient in a shaded area inside our tent and allowing intake of cool oral fluids if they're protecting their airway and are awake enough to do so. If the patient's a little sicker or not able to take in fluids, or if your passive methods aren't working, you need to go on to active cooling methods. This involves covering the patients in a wet towel, which is just with tepid water, a forced air cooling with fans, and also cooled IV fluids, all of which will be available in the tent. After initial treatment, if the patient is maintaining well and their temperature is going down and they're looking okay, they can possibly be released back to family. But if the patients continue to display ultramental status or have a temperature that is not improving, this requires transportation to the emergency department. The next condition, which doesn't exactly require high temperatures, is exercise-associated collapse. This can be the leading cause of treatment after our race. A lot of people start hitting the ground after the finish line or right before the finish line. Majority of these patients actually do well and are able to be treated and released. Our initial treatment will include checking and ma maintaining ABCs, giving oxygen for hypoxia. If they're awake and not altered, we can encourage oral fluid intake. Most importantly, we need to evaluate for life-threatening or other treatable causes that we don't overlook and just pass off as a tired runner. Now, all patients with collapse who remain comatose or altered, who do not improve with treatment, or who have another concern for underlying disease like a cardiac disease, or who meet criteria for heat stroke require transport. Any transportation of any patient can only be activated by the medical director. Now if any of you have run 9.3 miles, you know that shortness of breath afterwards is pretty common, but there are some other diseases we need to be on the lookout for. First off, exercise-induced bronchospasm, then asthma, COPD, allergic reactions, and cardiac disease. These are the patients that even a few minutes after the race has stopped, they're still really struggling to breathe. The initial treatment for these patients includes checking and maintaining ABCs, delivering oxygen via non-rebreather mask, giving nebulized medications for wheezing patients, and administering EpiPens for allergic reactions. Now, all patients with persistent shortness of breath despite treatment, continued hypoxia, altered mental status, or those who require prolonged nebulized medications or oxygen require transport to the hospital. Now, GI issues are unfortunately very common in long distance runners. This can include bloating, cramping, nausea, vomiting, and also post-race rectal bleeding. Now, for the most part, these patients are just going to need antiemetics for nausea and vomiting, uh, IV fluids if not tolerating PO, and then a PO challenge. For the most part, these patients do okay and end up going home. Now, any patients with persistent severe abdominal pain or intractable vomiting despite our initial treatment will require transportation to the emergency department. It is okay if these people continue to be nauseous as long as they're taking in oral fluids. And finally, a very common injury we'll see is musculoskeletal injury. This can be sprains, strains, bruises, cramps, blisters. We need to mainly focus on evaluating for any evidence of fracture. Once this is ruled out by history and exam, we can apply ice and massage, both of which are available in the medical tent. We will have licensed massage therapists and rehab therapists available in the personnel. We also want to encourage water and electrolyte intake and attempt early ambulation once initial treatment is done. Now, any patient with suspicion for fracture or dislocation requires transportation to the ED. All other patients can be treated and released. So those are all the conditions we will see. Now for some conditions that we may see, in general the more critical conditions. First off, cardiac emergencies and then neurological emergencies. Now any patient with chest pain requires a very detailed history and physical exam to evaluate for cardiac problems. These cannot be missed in these runners. While these emergencies can happen really in any patients, we do have some high-risk features that we can think of. First off, older age, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes, in general what we call typical chest pain, which is chest pressure radiating down one of the arms. Having said this, we can't downplay any chest pain, and like I said before, all these patients require a detailed history and physical and consultation with the medical director. Once we suspect active cardiac disease, these patients can receive aspirin and ECG, which can be administered by the Century Ambulance crew, and rapid transport to the emergency department. Once again, all chest pain patients need to be run by the medical director. Now, one of the scariest and most devastating neurologic emergencies we may see at a race is a stroke. If we have someone who is suspecting a stroke, we also need to evaluate for any other reversible causes of the symptoms, like hypoxia, hypoglycemia, and hyperthermia. An easy, rapid field tool to use to evaluate for stroke is the mnemonic FAST. F stands for face, so ask the patient to smile and look for any asymmetry. A stands for arms, ask the patient to hold the arms out in front of them and look for any weakness. 
S stands for speech. Ask the patient to say a simple sentence and check for slurring. And T stands for time. Find out exactly when the symptoms began. Now any patients with positive findings on this tool or with any other findings concerning for stroke require a rapid check and maintenance of ABCs and preparation for transport to the emergency department. If you have any concern for stroke in any patient, please consult the medical director. Now to summarize the medical treatments, first, always start with ABCs. Second, remember that our primary goal is treat and release. A majority of these patients do not require transportation to the emergency department. Our job is rapid triage and figure out who is sick and who is not. And third, know your limitations. Think ahead for sick patients and alert the medical director for any possible transports. In addition, don't downplay fit runners with chest pain and shortness of breath. Yes, we do expect this in some people after a long race, but we can't miss cardiac emergencies. The EMS unit can perform an ECG if needed. Also, evaluate and treat reversible causes of ultramental status, as these are very common in runners. This includes hypoxia, hypoglycemia, and hyperthermia. And now for a quick overview of the Contour Glucose Monitor, as this might not be the device you use in your shop. Testing with the Contour system. Have all the materials you will need available. You'll need your contour meter, test strips, and the lancing device with lancets. Now, wash your hands thoroughly and you'll be ready to test. Remove a test strip from the bottle and then close the bottle tightly. Check the expiration date to be sure the strips are still good. Make sure the test strip does not appear torn or damaged. Hold the strip with the gray end facing up. Insert the gray end into the test strip port on the meter. Remember, no coating is required. The meter will turn on and a test strip with a flashing blood drop will appear on the screen. This lets you know the meter is ready to test. Utilize your lancing device to obtain a drop of blood. Only a very small drop of blood is needed. Test immediately after you've formed a blood drop. Touch the tip of the test strip to the drop of blood. Do not press the tip against the skin or place the blood on top of the strip. The tip will pull the blood into the strip automatically. Hold the tip of the test strip in the blood drop until the meter beeps. The meter will automatically count down the five seconds until the test is done. Your result will then be displayed. Now this last section will summarize the medications available to us in the medical tent. It is important to note that the medical tent will not be carrying any controlled medications. These are available if needed via Sentry Ambulance at the directive of the medical director. We will have an adult code tray available, which will have all the medications needed for an ACLS-based resuscitation. Albuterol nebulizers will be available for patients with asthma exacerbation or bronchospasm. Glucose will be available in the form of dextrose 50% injection for hypoglycemia, which will be given as an IV push. For patients experiencing allergic reaction, we do have diphenhydramine, also known as Benadryl. We have 50 milligram capsules for mild to moderate disease who are protecting the airway. For more severe disease, we have 50 milligram per ml injection. In addition, we'll have epinephrine auto injectors, also known as EpiPens. These will be the 0.3 milligram adult doses. As a quick review, the EpiPen should be given on the anterior lateral thigh and held for 10 seconds. They are designed to go through clothing. If a laceration repair is needed on site, we have lidocaine 1% with and without epi. For GI issues, we have loperamide, also known as imodium, which is an anti-diarrheal. And for nausea, we have metoclopramide, also known as Reglan, as an injectable medication. Nitroglycerin will be available in the form of nitrostat 0.4 mg sublingual tablets for chest pain patients. And ondansetron, also known as Zofran, will be available as an injectable medication for nausea. And finally, over-the-counter medications, which will be available at the medical tent, are triple antibiotic ointment, aspirin, acetaminophen, and ibuprofen. Well, that's it for the medical training for the 2016 River Run. Thank you so much for volunteering to help out. We hope you have a great experience.